Hello and welcome to season three, episode 29 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa. All of our shows are recorded and available on YouTube, so if you miss out, you can always catch up later. Tonight, I am excited to have two phenomenal ladies joining us from the Dahlstrom Bird of Prey Center to share their insights and experiences on raptor rehabilitation. As a student, I volunteered at the center and being up close with some incredibly special birds certainly fueled my passion to work more closely with them later in life. But before we get to that, just a reminder to communicate with us using the chat and Q&A feeds in Zoom or the comment feed on Facebook Live. And we will be sure to answer all of your questions at the end of tonight's webinar. We are on all major social media channels and you can use the hashtag conservation conversations to let us know what you think of tonight's show. A big thank you as always for the generous contributions towards our webinars, which have helped to keep these shows free for all to learn and enjoy. All you have to do is visit our Cricket page or EFT BirdLife South Africa directly and use the reference webinars with your name. We'd like to remind everyone about the 2023 Kruger Bird and Wildlife Challenge taking place from 12 to 19 February 2023 in partnership with Rock Jumper Birding Tours. Funds raised will be going towards our White Wing Flucktail Conservation Project and teams made up of South Africans who register before tomorrow, the end of this month, will qualify for a discounted rate. You can still book if you have not yet done so, just visit Rock Jumper Birding's website and find out more. We are starting to prepare for BirdLife South Africa's next major flock event, which will take place at the Wilderness Hotel from 24 to 28 May 2023. There will be lots of exciting birding on offer, as well as the biannual Learn About Birds event, which includes both a science and layman's lab. BirdLife South Africa's AGM will also be taking place on the Saturday with a luncheon thereafter. Be sure to visit our website to find out more. We're also excited to launch a new range in BirdLife South Africa's Shop for the Birds. This will be a range of shirts and you can hop on to the online store, find your birding fashion with a whole range of colors and sizes, all thanks to Johnson Workwear. And just to note, the golf shirts will only be loaded on from next week, but you can contact Claire Neal if you would like any more information. And finally, on to tonight's main event. We are joined tonight by the managers and trustees of the Dahlstrom Bird of Prey and Rehabilitation Center, Frith Douglas and Mahdali Tehran. These amazing ladies took over the center in 2014 after the previous manager, Mark Holder, sadly passed away. Frith has been involved in wildlife rehabilitation for around 25 years, and I'm proud to say is also a fellow old girl of St. Andrew's School for Girls in Bedford View, where I too did my school years. Mahdali Tehran studied game farm management and holds extensive experience in captive animal husbandry and falconry techniques. The Dahlstrom Bird of Prey Center has been around since 1998 and serves as both an education center and a rehabilitation center. If you've not yet visited this fantastic facility, I would highly recommend it and I guarantee you will learn a whole lot about the phenomenal birds of prey that we are lucky enough to have here in South Africa. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to now hand over to the two of you to take it away. All right, we're just going to let the, the techno gremlins do their thing. <laughs> Frith, Mahdali, are you guys still with me? Oh, right. sorry, yes. Here we go. <laughs> 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 the Zoom gremlin <laughs> taking hold. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to try to find the webinar. Here we go. Right, we are. Techno gremlins, we are more <laughs> hands on people. Can, I hope everybody can hear us. Um, so what we do and what we are, I'll give you a bit of a history of um, where we come from and everything like that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of share a couple of our 
our key mark cases that we've had over the range of birds that we've had and hopefully give you a bit of insight into how raptors um, can be used as indicator species of what is happening in the environment around us. And if anybody's been to Dahlstrom, well, some of you have, and that's great. If you haven't, uh, this is the first sign that will um, attract, well, you'll see when you come into Dahlstrom. As you um, come from uh, Joburg, we sort of on the way to um, Leidenburg and Hutzbreit, so we're on a major route to the Kruger Park. We are just outside the town of Dolstrom um, on the corner of the R540 and the Kreisfontein Road. Uh, and those are sort of, uh, we, we sort of, that's, that is what you will see. We do flight displays, handling days, photo days, school groups, but Mochley will get into that a little later. Um, but just to sort of give you an idea of where we are based. Dolstrom is a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, it is a mecca for fly fishermen. But we also do have probably all the seasons in a day. Um, you can uh, arrive in mist, uh, have wind, rain, and then the sun comes out and then you have a beautiful day afterwards. Um, so the birds and the rehab, it does become quite challenging in that you've got to always take into consideration uh, the environment and, and the weather. For um, flying demonstrations, we can't fly the birds if it's too windy um, and, uh, and, and those sort of things because our birds do come first. Um, and as we say, we are not an entertainment center. We're an education center. And our goal is to try and impart to people um, a bit more about how wonderful raptors are, how they fit into the environment, and how when you work walking around or driving around, not to always look at your feet, but actually look to the skies, because there's some amazing stuff out there that if you just look around, you, you'll be amazed at what you can see. A little bit of the history. Uh, the center was started in 1988 by the two Englishmen, mm -hmm. Mark Holder, the big Mark, and Mark Bett, the little Mark. Uh, both Marks were passionate about birds of prey and they were avid falconers. Um, it moved to its current location in year 2000. Uh, they built it up from scratch. They actually built the entire center in three months. Uh, so it was quite a, a rush to do that when they moved from the previous location, but they got it done. Um, and they ran the center for a number of years. Mark met a South African, little Mark, that is, met a South African teacher from Dolstrom, fell in love, and then, of course, with family commitments. Um, and if you know anything about rehabilitation, and not NGOs, there's not a lot of money in it, or there's actually no money in it. Um, and they ended up here to, um, he was forced to relocate back to the UK for family commitments, schooling and all of that. But he is still very much involved in the centre um, and uh, we are in contact all the time. Um, and he's a wonderful resource uh, to us. Mark Holder, unfortunately, was diagnosed with cancer in 2013. He returned to the UK just to have a hip replacement. And um, on landing in the UK, uh, he suffered, um, uh, he, he fainted. And then when they did tests, they did find that he had a brain tumor, which was inoperable. So they contacted us then and asked if we would like to take over the center to keep Mark's dream alive and to, to continue with his vision. Um, we were very interested in that, and um, when Big Mark passed away in 2014, uh, we decided to, to, to come in and take over to continue in Mark's footsteps. Very big shoes to fill, and um, we can only hope that we have um, kept his legacy alive and we are doing him proud. As you can see, it's now the two girls running the centre. <laughs> um, and uh, to secure, so what we did was when we first arrived here, there was a lot of strain they wanted to close the center down um, so we had to find a way to make sure that the birds were secure and what we then did was we established the wildlife sos trust um, which is this only the second trust in the country which is based on wildlife um, where the animals are actually the beneficiaries very difficult to open up a bank account when you want to do that because they want to you to itemize the beneficiaries and then we have to say to the bank manager, oh, well, do you want a species list of all the animals in South Africa? Because that's who the beneficiaries are. Um, with the assistance of a very good friend of Mark's, who's our earth angel, 
we were able to secure a bond to buy the property and the bond, the property was then transferred into the trust. So now the birds are secure. They can never, their, their home cannot be taken away from them. So in essence, we now work for the birds, um, which we love to do. Uh, we do what we love and we love what we do. What I say we do in rehab, um, I always look at the domino effect. Um, often we are put in a place, uh, a vocation, a calling, where you feel you've got to do something. And that's what both Mochtli and I are very passionate about what we do. Um, we feel that we need to make a difference. And with all of the external threats on wildlife and nature, um, we are trying to, to stop the domino effect by placing ourselves between wildlife and conservation and trying to make a difference in that way. Yeah, so as Mahli, I'm just going to take over from here a little bit, just talking about the education part of things, because I'm basically doing the flying demonstrations, etc. Now, I'm as Afrikaans as you can get, so excuse my English sometimes. Um, but at the end of the day, guys, we we feel like conservation through education. All right. So uh, we do flying demonstrations Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, uh, off peak and peak like uh, school holidays. We open from um, Wednesdays to Mondays. We're only closed on Tuesdays. And then we have flying demonstrations, obviously weather permitting. It's Dalstrom. Um, 1030 in the morning and 230 in the afternoon. Now, usually in the morning, we have uh, different birds that I fly from the afternoon. So I've got my morning team and I've got my afternoon team. So four different birds, you'll see it's about an hour's demo and then four different birds in the afternoon, also about an hour. I do include sometimes rehab birds that I fly for fitness, just to explain to the people, it's not always easy rehabilitation. You know, it's, 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 you know, it takes a bird anything from two months to two years to rehabilitate successfully back into the wild. So sometimes I do use my demo birds. Um, that is if they don't stress, if it's okay for them uh, to see the public, et cetera. Usually our rehab facility is off limits to the public because we want to give uh, the minimum human interaction and stress, et cetera. So my flying demonstrations, I think is, is, is quite educational. I always say to people, I don't do shows, it's demonstrations. I don't know if Paul dances with music. Um, it's uh, basically demonstrations. This to show the birds as natural behaviors. Um, so what I do usually, I fly uh, birds like, uh, if you can see in the picture, uh, African Harrier Hawk, a Galbong Falk, and then uh, Verose Eagle, um, Kestrels, uh, Falcons, Owls, you know, uh, a lack of variety. So I want to show people that, you know, we are so rich in South Africa with the different, so many different kinds of um, different species of raptors. I mean, alone, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and what they can do, it's just magical, you know. Um, we, we're very, very uh, passionate about uh, the school groups coming through. We, do, we did a lot of effort with the schools. We try and get the message through, for example, that birds are not evil or, you know, don't use poison. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as our friendly poison, um, stuff like that. And, and, and the schools really, are, I'm, I'm very, 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 very lucky actually to, um, to have the schools now again after lockdown. Yo, we, we, we struggled a little bit to get the schools in because of, of COVID and so on. But now it's picking up. The schools are visiting and I absolutely love it uh, to get the education across and just to, to, to just tell the kids, you know, and just, you know, we do a little bit of interaction, handling experiences and so on. Not to get the wrong message across, not that birds of prey, any wildlife or pets, you know, wildlife belongs in the wild, not in your house. But at the end of the day, you need the birds. I always tell people, would they have come to the center? Would they have visited the center if there were no birds? I was just there standing talking. And usually the people tell me, no, they come for the birds. Guys, we need them as ambassadors. We need them to get the message across. So technically, they're the ones that get the message across. I'm just the voice. So we're very, very passionate about just sharing the birds with the people. And... Um, if you've been to my demonstrations, you'll know that uh, my birds come first. I never, ever fly my birds. If they're not happy to fly, I never force them. I ask them. And the people can see and they can learn. And, you know, I think birds are just misunderstood in a way. Uh, and if I can get that message across that, look at this bird, man, up close and personal. You can see your own reflection in this eye. Look at how amazing it is. Look how amazing it flies. Then I'm, then I'm happy, you know. If I can convert one person that comes to the center that's not a bird lover, that goes back and, and buys himself a pair of binoculars and a bird book, you know, I'm happy. <laughs> so, And then we have obviously photographic days, guys, where, where people can get like a close shot and they can practice. We've got workshops uh, that people are like um, 
uh, our good friends organize for us and then people come and take photos of our birds, you know, practice a little bit bird photography. That's also very cool. You know, like I've said, a nonprofit, it keeps us going, those uh, handling experiences where people can get up close and personal with the birds and just learn a little bit more about them. Also back of house, see what we do, how we how we health check, how we weigh the birds, how we, why, how we do use falconry for rehab, et cetera. And then of course, guys, it's a, it's a self-guided tour through our resident birds. So you guys can come in, we open at nine, we close at four, and then you can come in and, and read the stories. I mean, I know people don't read, but you must come and read the stories and, and take yourself through the center. It's actually, some of them, the stories are funny, some of them are sad, but you'll, you'll get an insight of why we need these birds and aviaries and why we have them and why we need them for, for educational purposes. So at the end of the day, that's basically what we do here at the center itself. Yeah. And it's back to me. Uh, so that's the one side of the things, the education center um, and the one that's open to the public. Then, of course, we have the rehab section uh, where we are permitted to rehabilitate all species of wildlife. But because we are a um, rehab uh, a bird of prey center, we do get, uh, we specialize in birds of prey. Um, we do um, everything from um, baby, you know, well, all species, um, and then also not so much birds of prey. We will do whatever whatever comes through. We believe that we must give each patient 100%, try everything we possibly can. Our last option is euthanasia, but in a lot of cases, um, sometimes, uh, you know, the injuries are too bad and you've always got to consider the quality of life of the bird. And um, if we can't get them back into, um, into the wild, uh, if they can't adapt in captivity to become an ambassador species, um, and if we can't put them in a breeding program, if, there's, if, if, if it's an endangered species that we can place them like that, then unfortunately the reality is that we, um, we have to euthanize. And um, it's, a, it's a fact of life, and um, it is a very hard decision to make, but it's one that we do do um, uh, with a lot of... Um, we think about it, and we do everything we can before we get to that step. I often use this in my talks, um, which I don't do a few, that's why I'm, I'm quite jittery. <laughs> um, but this is a very good slide to say what happens for us as rehabbers, um, or as vet veterinarians, or as um, animal health um, professionals. You know, if you've got, if you've got a, a problem and you need a legal advice, you go to a lawyer. If you want to build a house, you go to an architect. A mechanic has to fix your car. But when it comes to animals or animal health issues, that's what you must do. And my grandmother did this. And, oh, Dr. Google told me this. And um, no, you must use this and that. And everybody's got um, a, a cure for everything. And there's always um, self-prescribed drugs and uh, all of this information out there. And so by the time the animal ends up on your door, you have got a major fight on your hands to try and help this animal. Um, either it's been fed the wrong diet or the person has been wanting to, out of the goodness of their heart, help this animal. Um, but without the correct training, without the correct, um, you know, uh, professional, um, without being able to do it properly, they do more harm than good. And then we sit at the end of the day and we seem to be the bad guys when we have to put an animal down because it has gone past the stage where we can actually help it. We do do rescue. So what we do, we, we were in rehabilitation, it's rescue, rehabilitate and release. Those are the three words. So we get very much involved in trying to do rescues. Um, as you can see in the top left-hand slide there, it was a um, shabeen that had some owls that moved in. And um, everybody, you know, it is in cultures, owls are um, considered evil. And um, instead of them hurting the owls, um, they contacted us fortunately to come and remove them and exclude them. So often we have to get very dirty, grimy, climb ladders, um, deconstruct roofs and stuff like that to try and get the animals out and then to exclude the area. It's what we do, so we love it. Uh, on the top right-hand side there, uh, also in a township, um, a, a lot of owls moved into um, that spotlight 
on the top there, what was it like 30, 30 meters high? Yeah. We had to get a wonderful company sponsored that crane, and then we were pulled up in a in a sort of a, a cherry picker basket uh, all the way to the top there to um, check that there were no eggs and chicks in there, and then to exclude the area so that the owls wouldn't move in there. We also get a lot of calls from mines and from um, you know places that are the farmers who have um, you know during the the, the down season these animals owls and what have you and, and kestrels and those sort of things move in and have their babies and now comes the time when the guy needs to use his equipment again or the conveyor belt has to start up again and um, they've come across a, a nest that then has to be removed um, so then we've got to you know gear up and do all the safety drill and everything and go in there and get our hands dirty to get the animals out um, so it, it, it is quite an in, involved Thing in rescue but um, it's actually quite exciting as well. Then as far as the rehabilitation side of things is concerned, um, of course imprinting, especially in raptors, can happen very easily and um, that is why we do say that you've got to get a patient or a baby bird to a professional rehab center as soon as possible because they know the techniques of how to raise that animal so that it does not imprint on humans. Because once it has imprinted on humans, you cannot release that bird back into the wild because it doesn't see itself as a bird anymore or an owl anymore. It sees itself as a human. And uh, quite a few of the birds that are uh, um, resident in our center are from that very reason where people have raised it out of the goodness of their heart thinking they were doing something right. Um, and then when it came to releasing them, they let it go and it flew into the neighbor's kitchen asking for food or whatever it might be. So um, we say get it to us as soon as possible. We've got, um, we either then put it in with surrogate parenting. Top right hand side there is Molly, our spotted eagle owl. And um, Oh, sorry, top, top left hand side. Um, and she, sorry, my left and right are terrible. Top left hand side, she raises on average 23 orphans a year for us who um, then are raised wild and then can go into uh, soft release cages and can be released. If not, we don't have a surrogate mom like her, we then like to do something like crash rearing where you do do co specifics uh, together so that they imprint on each other. Uh, and in that way, they learn to be an owl and not to um, accept us as, 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 as their parent. We also make the use of puppets um, so that they don't physically see us presenting the food, um, so that they do not associate the humans with the food. And in that way, they are able to um, imprint on each other and be able to be released. You do then get your odd uh, fish eagle or one of the bigger eagles who are loners and you can't have a co-specific with it. Then we've got to do everything in our power to try and create an environment where all they see is an adult or is presented as natural as possible. So we use mirrors, we use pictures, uh, minimal contact uh, to try and get them to self-feed. And in that way, um, they can start um, uh, um, life knowing that they're an eagle. Um, so we minimize human contact um, as, as much as possible. And that's why a lot of people always want to come and volunteer and they want to play with the animals and, you know, be involved. And um, that is not, I don't allow that. Um, and it is because we've got to make sure that that animal can get back into the wild. So it's minimal human contact. It's basically just making sure that their needs are met, uh, uh, co-specific to what they need. And, and we use, um, and that's, that's, that's as far as it goes. Uh, where we do have um, uh, the issue is with when you've got falcons and certain animals where you've got a test flight, uh, test fitness before release, then um, we make use of what is known as falconry techniques to do that. And um, I'll hand over to Mokhli, she'll explain what, what, what happens there. Right, so a lot of people, guys, I mean, a lot of people, uh, they come here, they see the birds are tied down on a glove, on a perch, and they go, oh, that's so cruel. You, you're you hurting the animals. You're so cruel tying them down. You know, you know, people don't understand. So that's why I want to just explain quickly. The fitting of the equipment is done, obviously, the correct way. So the bird doesn't hurt itself. The bird 
if the bird tries to get away, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't rip the legs off or it doesn't hurt the legs. And that, so it's called anklets around the legs. And then it's basically called jesses that you put through the anklets. Uh, can I explain like this? It's like a dog's collar, basically, that you put on the bird just to control those weapons. I don't know if you guys can see. That's the feet that on the left uh, top is a fish eagle's feet. Né? <laughs> if those things grab you, you're going to ignore, I promise you. So basically, that is why we have those also to protect ourselves, but also to try and control the bird to work, to sort of work that the bird can work with you, not against you. So you can actually train the bird up properly. So you can, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, guys, you need to control the bird in the first, because this, these birds hate you. They don't like you. And then if you can't control the bird somehow, you're never going to be able to do rehab because you're never going to be able to train that bird properly. So initially what you do, you make the bird trust you. So while you do that is on the glove, positive, 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 food, 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 get the bird to trust you, basically just tether it when you need to, on the glove, on the perch, and when that bird is ready um, to fly free, obviously you fly it at least once or twice a day, all right, sometimes three times a day if you need to, so that bird gets its freedom, but you have to sort of get the bird there to be able to do your rehabilitation work. Guys, I don't know what we're going to do without uh, the tethering techniques, how are we, how are we ever going to do rehabilitation? Because you need that. All right. So just to explain that is not being cruel. You have to, with birds of prey, guys, you have to sometimes tether and you have to sometimes hood. Now, I see, we don't have a picture of a hood on the screen, but you can see the, the right-hand corner, up, up corner, um, up on the right hand, it's basically Alana Falcon. Uh, her name is, is Ginger. She basically gets hooded. So basically what you do is you cover the eyes. It's, it's, it's not stress for any wild animal, guys. So you, you measure the head, you make the hoods, and the hood doesn't hurt them, and it's positive. So every time the hood comes off, food. Before the hood goes up, food. If the hood doesn't hurt them, great, positive. And sometimes you'll find that these birds will take their head and put them into the hood because they know it doesn't hurt them and they know they get rewarded. All right. So everything is done to the birds you know, whatever the bird, you know, minimal stress, Stan. but you need these techniques, guys, to, to rehab, especially falcons, et cetera, for fitness. And you can see um, there's one of our volunteers, Isabella, there in the, in the uh, bottom, bottom right, flying a falcon to the lure. Now, that's basically swinging around a, a, a rope with a piece of chicken on it there at the end, looking like a wannabe cowboy trying to catch a horse. But you're actually trying to get your falcon fit, bird, bird fit, to assess, can that bird hunt in the wild? Can it, and then you go into the wild. You go into the felt with your useless pointer dog like me. He thinks he's a Jack Russell. Then you go into the felt and you basically get your dog on point. He works with you. He gets the quarry. Argument's sake, for example, he points the Franklin in the felt. Then you basically use that techniques to, and your dog flushes the Franklin. Your bird comes in and, and it catches the Franklin or misses the Franklin. You know, it's always, always okay. But you make it as natural as possible, guys. So you can, you can always um, uh, release that bird back into the wild. You don't want to train them incorrectly because at the end of the day, if you, if you do something uh, besides the natural behavior, you can train them wrong and they won't survive in the wild. So you try these techniques. Um, it's very important for rehabilitation. Um, and we cannot do our rehab without falconry techniques. So you basically go hunting with your bird. That's basically it. In a natural environment where the prey item has a fair chance to escape, and we also can use falconry as, as, as a natural pest control to get the to get the birds away from the from the crops. You know, just the presence of that bird of prey makes the bird go ah, and they and then they, they fly off. You know what I'm saying? So basically, yes. Um, but for rehabilitation purposes, fitness, hunting, if that bird can go, it must go back into the wild. All right, so basically what we do, we, we, we can see for our, for, for our rehabil uh, rehabilitation purposes, we put trackers on these birds, all right. So that's a very lonely thing. We're very privileged to have that. We did a little fundraiser for our GPS system. It's very long. You can actually see on the screens there, uh, this is actually uh, one of the birds that yeah, is the, is the, um, the maximum altitude and, and the maximum speed and stuff. I think this was a specifically, it was a falcon that, that actually did this. Um, they go high, guys. They go high and they, and, and they come, come in very, very fast. I mean, uh, a long wing is, is, is built for speed. So we put these uh, on the birds to obviously not lose them before, before release or for our demonstration birds that's here to stay so they don't get lost and they don't fly away. So basically, it's also for, for rehabilitation purposes to see from a bird that couldn't even fly 100 meters to this. I mean, this is incredible. And this specific bird that this, this I'll stand still later, but she was successfully released back into the wild after she was shot. But I'll go into detail a little bit later. Right now, it's first turn again. Now, how can we do all of this? We can't do this without proper training. So Mockley and I have, uh, you know, extensive knowledge in rehabilitation. We attend courses. 
on the top left hand side there that's Neil Forbes from the UK he came out and did a uh, an advanced avian um, rehabilitation course, uh, which we attended. Um, you need to know how to properly deal with these birds. As we say, they are wild, they are raptors, they have beaks, they have claws. You've got to be able to do husbandry techniques properly. You've got to be able to do things like coping, um, beak lengths and stuff like that. And then we also uh, you know, need to have, uh, if you've got to fit trackers, you've got to do that properly. You need to be able to learn how to do that. And then we also, very importantly for post-release monitoring, um, your birds need to be ringed. And Mochley and I have fortunately uh, recently um, got our ringers license for rehab. So we are able to now, instead of having to pull in ringers from outside, uh, where you have to hold back a lot of birds that can be released until you can get an, a, a, a qualified ringer to come in and ring them for you before release, we are now able to do that ourselves. And so the turnaround of um, our patients is a lot faster because as a bird is ready for release, we can immediately ring it um, and release it. We couldn't do it without an amazing, amazing vet uh, teams. We travel very far for that. Um, there are very few avian vets or ones that are willing to work on wildlife. Um, in South Africa, we have the knowledge, um, so we actually work with these two veterinary practices. It's White River Vet in White River. Um, they're an amazing group of, of vets who will go beyond the call of duty to do the best for whatever we bring in. Nothing is too much of a challenge for, the, for them, um, and um, they are just the most amazing people to work with. Uh, then we also work on the other side, two kilometers, two hours the other direction, uh, with Ornestapurt, with Dr. Dorian of the Bird and Exotic Animal Hospital at Ornestapurt, a phenomenal avian vet uh, who, uh, you know, is, is amazing in what she does and uh, how she's able to do, do diagnostics. Um, so, she's also a falconer. <laughs> and she is a falconer as well. So she understands a lot of the, you know, behind the scenes um, and, and those sort of, you know, the techniques and what is needed in a highly strung bird and stuff like that. So we couldn't do it without, without these amazing vets. Um, you know, we just rehab as there's a lot we can't do. Uh, legally, we're not allowed to do anything. Uh, we're not registered with SAVC. Um, so it's fantastic to have um, people in the veterinary profession who are also passionate about wildlife and will go beyond the call of duty to, to, to try and, um, uh, and help us. Um, and as you will see, a lot of the, the cases that we show you, um, these vets have been involved in, in, in helping us get those birds through. We also have to have collaboration with other rehab facilities and other organizations. Um, we are members of what is known as the core group. That's a coalition of re rehabilitation expertise. Um, it's a uh, sort of a board. Uh, of all the rehabs or a lot of the rehabs across the country um, and we're all involved in, in sharing knowledge, sharing um, uh, resources to get the best, uh, quickest care for patients uh, across the country um, if the case may be. So if we get a call for something that is out of our province, um, because then you've got the whole logistics of permitting and import export permits. If you can then refer to a, another rehab facility that you that, that, that are all on the same ethical and um, um, professional level to go out and help that animal, then we know that that animal is going to get the help it needs sooner rather than later, which is which is in a lot of cases critical to get the animal to a vet or a, a rehab facility as soon as possible if it's a major injury. And then you've got to also work with um, NGOs like BirdLife, Endangered Wildlife Trust. As you will see in our cases, um, we've, we've got affiliations with, with both these amazing organizations where they are able to help us with um, things like tracking devices, stuff that we just don't have the resources to do. Um, and the wealth of knowledge they have in the, in the um, you know, amongst their staff and their, their, their members is, is phenomenal for us to be able to do what we need to do. So we're going to now just go through a couple of our cases um, um, and we'll, we'll sort of 
talk you through what we did with each one and uh, sort of, um, yeah, let's enjoy what our, our few, these are successes. And I must admit, we have a lot, a lot of failures as well, but you've got to take from your failures um, whatever lessons you can to apply to future um, to make sure that the following case you get in, uh, you, you can apply what you've now learned to make a better case for that. So I'm going to hand over to Mark Lee for the first one. I say. Now, guys, um, as you know, uh, like I said, two, two months to two years for rehab. Eh? Um, now, this specific bird, we call the ginger. Now, we don't always name our patients because it's, it's very difficult to let go at the end of the day. I mean, there goes ginger. I needed three boxes of tissues. Anyway, at the end of the day, you need to realize that put your emotions aside, do what's best for the bird. All right. Now, this specific guy is, man, oh, man, I love this bird. So she came and she was shot, ne? All right, so she was shot because she went after someone's racing pigeons. Now, guys, I ask you with tears in my eyes how this bird is supposed to know the difference between a racing pigeon and a normal pigeon. They don't know. They're in the first year. They're still stupid. They're still learning. And then you go and shoot the bird. I mean, that's not fair. At the end of the day, guys, this bird had a, had a, had a wing fracture, okay, because the bullet just scraped the bone. Uh, I just missed it, eh? And um, she came in from, uh, I think it was Pretoria area. I'm not too sure. Anyway, so she came in. 2018 and immediately i start uh, manning this bird i started getting her used to the glove i started getting into and then i used falconry techniques on her now guys she gave me a run for my money hey because they're animals and eh? that's why i fly them with telemetry because her nickname was middleburg and it's about an hour's drive from here and she always always used to take off she would spec out a kilometer out She's like, where is Machtili? She can't see me. And then she just goes, all right. And I'm like, where's Ginger? <laughs> you know? So she, she is, it, it's quite a, it's quite lucky to travel with these, uh, to travel around fetching these birds, but it also happens. So she was a case of, she went to Rome. All right. And immediately when I spotted her, when I got her, she immediately came down to me and she immediately um, let me feed her and let me hood her. So that hood that you see on there is what I wanted to explain earlier is the stress. So you basically put the hood on and you basically just um, level the stress out for them. And uh, after she's eaten there, I've put the hood on, I climbed in my bucket and I brought it back to the center. All right. So this is one of our success cases that we actually released. Guys, I want to show you this slide. Check that uh, maximum altitude. It's over a kilometer up into the sky. Eh? Now that's what you want from your falcons because they hunt with speed. They come down and they club those prey items. So basically she had the maximum speed. That was a record of um, 133 kilometers an hour that she came down on the stoop. Now, this was a very good flight at the center where I basically fitness trained this bird and she came down and in the next slide, you can see she caught the lure. All right, so this bird, I was hunting with her. I was I was out in the felt. She took, <laughs> unfortunately, but that happens. If you guys know birds, you'll know that uh, she took like black shouldered kites. She took um, uh, Franklin, uh, et cetera. So she was ready to go. She was fit. I ha I'm not going to be, uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I, I kept her a little bit back because I was, I was not ready. Me, I wasn't ready to release her. So, but when she was ready and when I was ready, I did release her back into the wild. And we did ring her. We didn't have... Uh, the resources to put a track on her but i do believe she's still out there doing her thing i have to believe that all right so another case that i'm just quickly going through is alexia uh, let's just spot it now this this poor thing uh she was shot and then she was diagnosed with west nile um so let's just spot eagles if you, if you guys might know they are actually phenomenal um migratory species that go up to to russia and so on um if they if they go up and, and they feast on the quillias and then they go for the for the um for the long ride. Now she was actually, I'm not too sure what happened, but she broke the wing. So our beautiful vets there at White River, they, they, they pinned the wing, everything was fine. And now it was up to us to basically get her fit and get her ready. So what we've actually done guys, she had an ulnar fracture. Um, it was pinned nicely. As you can see on the second picture there to the right, it was a beautiful fracture. It was, it was nicely pinned and it healed properly. So what we've basically done is, is, is we've put her, uh, um, uh, put her in for rest and then, <laughs> then her feathers started dropping all right so her feathers started dropping but it was this weird if you can see it on this picture and this is typical west nile disease and then we tested and it was positive you see guys the the, the, the feathers pinch in this incident uh, the, uh, with the west nile it pinches and it falls out and it doesn't grow back properly so we had to keep that poor bird for for what was it two years mm -hmm. so um when the when the feathers grew out and we got uh, um, control over the west nile and it was gone out of a system uh, we just waited patiently for the first grout and then we released them. Now we did actually um, put a put a tracker on 
um, via um, um, Andre Boeta and, and Matthijs Prommer, he actually, uh, uh, where is he from? Um, I can't remember now, but he, he does studies on the Geo Falcon and he puts trackers on them and stuff. He's also very, very, uh, uh, he, you know, he's, he does studies on the birds, etc. cetera. Uh, so we worked with, with Andre and he came uh, to, to help us um, put the tracker on Alexia. As you can see in the next slide, um, and then um, yeah, we we had actually we had a problem. Hey, eh? uh, the feathers. <laughs> she was so fluffy. The feathers actually grew uh, over the tracker, and I'll tell you now what happened with the release. So so here in the, in the bottom picture, we actually clipped the anchors off. Now this is after using falconry techniques. This is after flying her, and she was doing great. She was thermaling. She was coming down for quarry, uh, quarry meaning you know food, um, a wild wild quarry. And then we basically thought she was ready. Her feathers were beautiful. Everything was fine. The, 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 the West Nile was out of the system. We cut off the anklets. We cut off everything. We left the tracker on. And then we released her. All right. So this is just a, a quick slide of her movements. And then, of course, the, the feathers grew back over the tracker. And Matthijs told me, um, actually, that the, 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 the tracker was busy giving problems. And it was because uh, the, the feathers was growing back over the tracker. So, so, so they're very fluffy. And obviously, next time we learn from our mistakes, we'll, we'll, you'll use a different tracker, maybe a little bit higher on the bird. But you don't want it to, to, to be too invasive on the bird. So that's why the trackers is the, you know designed the way they are. So it doesn't irritate the bird, doesn't harm the bird, doesn't affect the flight, et cetera, et cetera. But this specific case, when she was in Tanzania, it bombed out. And so we're not too sure what happened. We believe the bird is still okay and doing fine out there, but the tracker did seem to, to call in, not call in, call in, got call in, and then it bombed out completely. So I definitely fault with the tracker because the movement was still accurate before that happened. Uh, so that was also one of the very, very cool success cases that we had. And um, it's very interesting to see this movement. Tonight. She knew exactly what to do. She came, she went straight when the, when the time was right. She went straight up north and she was heading towards her, her goal up there. So, um, yeah, also a privilege working with that bird. I'll take over for this one then. Um, as you see, this one doesn't have a name because she was in quite early, quickly in and out, or he was. Um, this was a crowned eagle. I don't know if any of you know the Hazy View area. Between White River and Hazy View, there is a lot of, well, no, there's actually quite a small amount of um, normal um, uh, riverine forests, which they um, always have a habitat in. Um, and this is one of the indicators here. There's a loss of habitat. Their habitats are shrinking like you can't believe. So this poor creature was flying along hunting um, and came out on a road and collided with an ice cream truck. Um, so as you can see what happened here, um, the people stopped immediately, uh, picked up the bird and took it through to our White River vets, which was amazing because um, it, was, it was their normal vet, so it actually worked out perfectly. Um, so this was crowned eagle was taken through to our normal vets um, and x-rays revealed that the leg um, was broken. Uh, it was just the one leg, he had a bit of bruising on the wing but, and, and a bit of concussion, but fortunately it was only this, this, um, this one fracture, which our vets did pin, then in the bottom there you can see um, what the pinning is, they do external fixators, we found that on birds of prey, specifically the external fixators are the way to go, because it stops the bones from rotating. Uh, in the past and through trial and error, we have learned um, that if you do do just an internal intermedullary pin, um, the bird's wing, or the, especially on the wings, if it's a wing injury, um, it does tend to rotate in the um, healing process, and that causes the wing not to be able to function properly, and the bird then will, basically it works out, you kind of fly in circles. Um, so we then, uh, through Niels Forbes training and everything uh, that our vets went to, um, he also says external fixators are what, what the way to go. And we do that on all of our cases now. And um, since we've been starting to do external fixators, it seems to work a lot better. So there she was in the clinic. Uh, after all, this is a, you know, this is a apex species. So you do kind of uh, cringe every time you have to, <laughs> to look after a bird like this because you don't know, just look at those feet. Um, but it was six to eight weeks um, and then the, the pins were removed 
and then we put this bird in a flight aviary to gain fitness. It was an adult already. It didn't need to be taught anything. It just needed to um, have a few months in, in, in our flight aviary. We're fortunate to have um, a very big flight aviary, about 30 meters by 20 meters, um, that does offer this. Uh, we'd love to build at least three more of those, but um, you know, they are very expensive to do. Um, but uh, we did that, and um, this, this bird healed nicely. We then got Endangered Wildlife Trust, had the spare tracker. It was a secondhand tracker, um, but it was spare. So we said, ask Gareth Tate if, if we, could, we could just put it on the bird just for post-release monitoring. He came out and he did that for us. And uh, then we released the bird back in Hazy View where it came from. Um, and it did track for a while, but then as it was a secondhand tracker, it did bomb out as well. Um, but they have been seen in the area still. So um, we are, are certain that this bird had a full recovery. Another case that we've had in, uh, this one also hasn't had a name, although she has been with us for quite a while. Quite a while. Um, this is a stork, a white stork that came in from Leidenberg, uh, came in heavily underweight, um, high, paras uh, high parasite load, and we just couldn't quite understand what was wrong with this bird. Uh, wouldn't eat. We had to tube feed sort of small amounts for, for quite a while and then eventually got it onto eating um, day old chicks. And she would devour seven to eight chicks in a sitting, but she just never gained weight. Uh, she never gained, uh, you know, she, she was just always down and always depressed. Um, winter came, so we, we had to overwinter her and it was sort of right at the time when they were supposed to be migrating, but we thought, let's just take it to our vet uh, for a full over, you know, once over to see what might be happening. And you will see from the next slide, um, X-ray revealed what looked like a monstrous tumor in her, which took up most of her body cavity. Um, so they decided to do an operation immediately to see what it was because they couldn't quite decipher. And, um, on the right hand side, what you see came out of that stomach, it was rubber bands. Um, this is something we've not seen in South Africa. And the strange thing is that within two weeks of this, another rehab center in Gauteng had the same problem. They thought oh, the bird was egg bound. And I said, no, please get them to check out this. And it was exactly the same issue. After then doing some research, there are quite a lot of papers on this in, um, in Europe. What happens is these birds frequent rubbish dumps and they cannot tell the difference between a rubber band and a worm. So what they do is they ingest these thinking they are getting food in and because they cannot be digested, it just accumulates in the gut and eventually the gut is so full that the they're not getting the nutrition. Now, if you think about these poor birds have to migrate all the way down from Europe to Africa, and they are not getting the nutrition they need. So they're arriving here emaciated, they're arriving here down, you know, um, half dead anyway. And without us having to actually not knowing anything, we wouldn't have known to look for this. Um, so this was quite an interesting case. And um, the studies that have been done in Europe is that this is a major problem that the parents are taking these rubber bands back to the nests and are feeding it to their fledglings, which is causing a high mortality rate in nestlings in white stalks. So this is another environmental impact that we are seeing that you're actually not aware of. So these rubber bands that you see in this picture could actually have been from Europe, but have been sitting in this gut for years and just accumulating and accumulating. So the op was done, the bird is beautifully recovered. He's in our flight in Avery at the moment. Um, he's been, uh, we're gonna get, uh, he's ready for release. We've just got to wait for the white stalks to get back, which should be in the next few weeks. And as soon as the, we have a, a flock nearby, we will be releasing this guy. So this is a very interesting case we had. Right, our last case we're gonna look at is um, uh, what we generally call Dr. Mike. It's named after one of our vets and it's a Cape vulture. All right, guys, I know we're a little bit out of time, so I'll just be quick with this one. Um, yeah, this bird is actually also a very, very cool success story. And I mean, obviously, uh, flew into Escom Powerline, broke the broke the wing 
And um, basically, uh, what was it? what was the break again? It was but the metacarpal this rack. And the vets pinned the pinned the wing and we we put it in our flight aviary. We gave it some TLC. And at the end of the day, we released this bird. Now, what I want to stand still is um, the op was, was done by Dr. Benny, but uh, Dr. Mike assisted, and that's why we called it Dr. Mike. And with help from the EWT, we got a tracker, a pelvic tracker, actually. Very interesting. Not a backpack. It's actually pelvic. It's, it's, it's less, less um, how do you say, invasive. And uh, it, it's found that it's, it's um, you know, the, the, the vultures accepted uh, better and uh, there's less problems uh, found with that tracker on the, on the pelvis. So we, we fitted the tracker with the help of, of EWT, uh, Dr. Gareth Tate and the team. And then we released it. I'll check this video, guys. It's actually pretty amazing. I'm just going to go to the next slide um, where we actually tracked uh, on the tracker. Dr. Gareth Tate put this together for us where since release. Now, um, let's just, sorry. Yeah, let's just try and, and play this for you guys. We work with animals. We are a bit technologies gestrem. Sorry, guys. There we go. Look at that. So the red is a movement in a day. Now, this guy, he's done since release over 20,000 kilometers. <laughs> I mean, this guy moves around. I mean, check it out. So, I mean, the tracking devices that we put on these birds is essential for, for, also for rehabilitation purposes. Just to see how this guy roams. Now, we released him on the dam wall here by Dahlstrom, by our center. And he was from, was it from Woodsprite? Woodsprite. Woodsprite. And we released him. And guys, within two days, he was back with his colony. All right. And the good news is the EWT informed us. They went to check on them, you know, monitoring. He's actually, he's, he's reproducing. They, they actually is with his colony and he's making babies. So that's what you want, right? So actually look at the movements here, guys. It's actually brilliant how this guy moves around. Now, currently he's here. I've got the app on my phone. I can see where he is and what he's up to. So currently he's here in Carolina area. He came to visit us a couple of times. We saw him fly over the center. Um, and it's, it's so nice keeping tabs on him and to see he's doing so well and to see how rehab is actually working. And, and that's what we love to put these trackers on the birds to actually also just see if our rehabilitation is working, if we're doing, doing okay, uh, you know, the techniques we use, the, the way we do it, if it's working, if it's helping. And you can see on this video, this guy's motoring. So um, we're very, very proud of this guy specifically as well. All the other vultures we released as well with our trackers and stuff, it's, 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 it's actually sad you can't monitor them properly. But, you know, I said to Frith the other day, I said to her, it's actually so sad sometimes because the last vulture we released with a tracker, we released successfully, poisoning case, uh, pulled her through, Mensa, we released her. Two weeks later, she was electrocuted in Lichtenberg area. I mean, that's so sad. But anyway, so we have to, like Fris said, we have to focus on the success cases and we have to just learn from the mistakes. And, you know, you can't do really anything about electrocutions and stuff, but you can make a, a ESCOM aware, you can report it. They can mitigate some of the lines. So you, 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 there's always, always, um, um, you know, ways to fix things. And I think um, with this vulture, we had a little bit of a more of a, how do you say, more of a, you know, go, don't give up, just go. There, there's not always, it's not always negative. There is positive and just keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, it, it does make a difference. And what's nice with this sort of um, post monitoring um, releases is these cases can now be used and this information can be used in environmental impact assessments uh, for future projects, exactly. if it's power lines, if it's wind farms, if it's ever, these are things that we can then do. We can use this information and we can make it available to other people so that they can see um, you know, how amazing this, this, this bird is. The places he's been, since then there's been poisoning in the south of the park, um, and a poisoning in the north of the park, and he has been around there. So it is very unstuck for us because we always wonder if he's going to be one of those casualties. But touch wood, and thankfully he hasn't, and he's giving us some amazing, amazing data. So a lot of people, as you know, as I said, with tracking devices, a tracking device is like 80,000 Rand. Um, we just don't have those resources. And a lot of the public want to know and they want to get involved and they want to know how can they get involved. And one thing that I can say from, from a RIA point of view, what we do need is couriers. We need people all over the country to be able to be trained up in first, responding, uh, first responders, um, to be able to fetch a bird stabilize a bird and get it to the closest permitted rehab in the shortest possible time so that we can get the help for that patient as soon as possible for the best possible outcome. 
And um, you guys might be sitting wherever you are, uh, might be in a different country, but if you feel that you want to get involved and you don't know how, this is something that the public can do, um, is to get hold of your local rehabbers, uh, rehabbing facilities or what have you, um, and, and ask how can you help as a courier to get patients, because often, um, you know, there's a there's a, an, an injured owl here and it needs to get somewhere else and we just we just don't have the finances for petrol. Everybody knows what the fuel price is like. But if you guys are, you know, if you're reps or what have you, and you're all over the show, it might be something that you guys can definitely do. Um, training would be provided um, so that you could actually get, um, you know, be able to do rescue the, the, the bird safely. Uh, you'd be talked through it or ever, whatever, and then you'd be told where to take it. So that would be a fantastic way. And we would love to get a countrywide WhatsApp group all cases like this where, where everybody, you know, if you've got a case, you know that there's somebody close by who's willing and able to go out, get the patient and get it to the closest permitted rehab or vet. If anybody wants more information on that, you're welcome to in, uh, send an email to info at wildlifesos.co.za, subject courier, and let's see what we can do. If we can get a group of people together who are like-minded, who want to do something like this, it's only for the benefit of the birds in the long run. And that, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> is us. So um, it's now question and answer time. So back to you, um, Melissa, let us know um, if there are any questions. Thank you so much, ladies. That is absolutely fantastic. And thank you both for the incredible, incredible work that you do for our birds of prey and all the other wildlife that I know crosses your path. That was super inspiring. And I can see all of the amazing comments coming through and um, thanking you guys for the incredible talk and the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, before we dive into some questions, and I do have a few for you, um, we are going to be, wel be welcoming Justin Ponder in next week. So do join us for that. And uh, let me just do this. I, can you guys still hear me? Sorry, I see my yes, yes, camera. Yes, good, yes. There we go. My camera is acting up again as usual. <laughs> But uh, let's give another go and see if I can join you on screen. But if that doesn't work, no worries. <laughs> I'll just be a voice. <laughs> but uh, let's let's do this. Okay, first question while I thought out this uh, camera struggle. There's no <laughs> problem, no problem. <laughs> we'll jump onto the first question. And this is from Penny oh. Abbott. And uh, Penny was very interested. You mentioned excluding the area. Um, when you guys go and rescue birds, would you mind just um, unpacking that a little bit and, and sort of sharing how you exclude areas for the safety of the birds? Yeah, that would depend on the, on the situation. Of course, you go in and you assess what it is. Um, it might just be as something as simple as if they want uh, to have owls removed, you would remove, you'd, op you'd open up the roof or wherever it is, remove whatever is there because um, you know, they, they always leave castings and stuff like that. So you've got to remove what is there before, and then you've got to build it in so that they can't have access to that area again. Uh, also, what you do with those sort of things is by placing like a, if it's an owl, placing an owl box on the exterior of the building, um, it, it, it sort of um, gives them an, another option of where to go live um, and uh, so that they don't go into the roof. Um, other exclusions like with the, um, the that huge big um, tower light, what mm, spotlight, yeah, spotlight. Thing. Yeah. we actually what we did was we just went in and we took um, netting uh, and material and we stuffed it into the areas that they were using as a net so that they would not be able to nest there anymore. It just makes it uncomfortable for them to make them actually go and look for an alternative site. So that is what we mean by exclusion. Fantastic. Thank you for that. that answer and, uh, a question. I think so. And uh, in, um, have you guys got any favorite rescue stories besides the ones that you, you shared with us? Is there one that particularly jumps to mind? Oh, rescues, rescues. I think at the end of the day, it was the, the, the barn house in Ubaru. Uh, it was, they were actually moved into the to the warehouse and we had to catch them and we had to make a plan we sort of sourced 
um, uh, fishing, net. fishing net and everything that was available in Nubaru itself. And we, we had to make a plan with cable ties and all sorts just to get the little monsters that was, they were just sitting there chilling. And, and you know, people, the customers and stuff, they didn't want to go into the building because they had owls and so and they make a mess. So we had to make, make a plan in the building, quickly get the owls out and we relocated them. That was, that was for me, was was very cool. It's usually the little owls get into trouble, hey, I'm telling you, it's ridiculous. And then with the, the, with the falcons and stuff in the mine, with the mine shafts and, you know, the mine uh, in, the, in the big, uh, what do you call those places, man? That you have to climb up into the top and, and the oh, way about sure. area yeah. that you have to move them and stuff and you're like hey work the freeze and you're like checking this and no it's 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 quite it's not, it's, it's venturous and then you have to go and chase down a, a, a secretary bird that's got a broken wing but can still run and you have to go through the flay and it's winter and you freeze your butt off and oh yeah there's 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 a lot of things but my, my favorite was those barn owls that we just quickly had to make a plan there and the customers were like oh and we we just quickly netted them and we just tied them out and then we, we caught them and, and we relocated them yeah. amazing <laughs> no, it, uh, it definitely sounds like an extreme sport what you guys do too for yeah, well, sure <laughs> but um Speaking, speaking of baby owls, I know they come with uh, very pointy ends and you showed that beautiful uh, crown eagle with those monster feet. Um, are you, do you guys have to sort of reinforce your gloves when you work with birds like that? I mean, we know yes. they have the, the capability of crushing a, a primate skull. I'm sure your arm is nothing far off of that. <laughs> Yes, so I'm telling you, uh, the, the scores we had have of, of, of those guys, you know, and, and I always tell people, you know what, even working with the demo birds, not only rehab, just the demo birds, it's still a wild animal. You have to respect that. And it can happen like this, eh? And if it does happen, it's your own fault. I mean, you're the human with the brain. But uh, I'm telling you, I'm lucky to have this arm because that specific crown eagle in the photos, Yerlikite got me here, eh? All right, my error, my error, but I've got some nice scars to show. So, <laughs> but yeah, they, I'm telling you, it's scary sometimes. The, the power in those talents, Mensa, oh, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, um, you know, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm trying to brag, you know, the, the power in those, in raptors' feet. I mean, like your Varro's Eagle, 1.5 tons of crushing power. Mensa, those oaks take small kids, you know. Oh, sorry, small bucks. You know, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, uh, whereas eagles, I, I, I've got a photo of Andrew Keys that took a photo of a bird we called the Dactyl in a Magalisberg that took down a rooibok in 2017 on footage where he took the picture. A rooibok, a impala. I mean, so this is phenomenal now. But yeah, you have to have your big girl underwear on when you go and work with those birds. <laughs> Absolutely. And I suppose th this is a good segue to sort of say, you saw the ice cream truck and, and the bird kind of stunned there. As Joe Public, if they come across an injured raptor with particularly potent uh, appendages, what is the best course of action for someone to do to try and get that bird help if they can see that it is clearly in distress? Well, the, 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 the truck driver actually did the right thing. Yes, sure. Yeah, what, what you would do then, uh, you know, normally they're in shock. So that, that plays to your advantage. Uh, the strange thing with, um, with, with certain species as well is that as a defense mechanism, they play dead. So they're actually easier to handle uh, if they feel that they are, are, are going to be overpowered. But the best thing to do is to grab a, thing, a thick blanket or a towel or something. A jacket. A jacket to throw yeah. over the animal and then wrap it around it. Uh, avoiding the feet if you can grab the feet uh, uh, you know above the, the talons and then of course uh, for species like herons and that with the beaks uh, make sure that you're wearing goggles or glasses or make sure that you watch the beak uh, secure the beak somehow uh, that's the best and then put it in a in a box on a on something soft not just straight in a box because then they can injure themselves further by by scratching uh, but just in a box with some air holes just enough that it's big enough to hold the bird, not too much that they can fly around and injure themselves more or get the momentum to get themselves out the box. And then you've got to climb around in a car to try and catch it, <laughs> uh, which has happened by some people. Um, uh, you know, or, or if they, they put it in the boot and ended up at the vet yeah. and the vet opens the boot and this thing's jumping out of the vet. Uh, so, so in a box secure and then just get it to your closest vet, closer to, or phone a rehab center. They will then be able to talk you through how to safely get that bird to 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 the help it needs. Fantastic. And 
What are some of the more common injuries that you guys encounter with our birds of prey coming into your center? Uh, our major one is fences. Uh, I'd say that that is, is, is a major one. Vehicle accidents, um, but something just talking about the fences. The strange thing is that most of the injuries or most of the cases, it's the top strand. So what we try and tell farmers and, and, and anybody who wants to listen or can listen, if you just replace the top strand with normal wire, not barbed wire, you will save 80% of fence collisions. Uh, so that is it. Uh, it's, it's basically fences, cars. Poisoning is a major thing. Um, secondary poisoning, uh, people putting out uh, rac uh, you know, ratics and stuff like that, and then the owls getting it in. Um, and then uh, and with, with, with diseases like um, avian flu going around and that sort of thing, we have a lot of uh, the pigeons are exploding. They carry diseases. There's a lot of trichomonas going around, which is easily treatable if caught early. Yeah. Um, so it's just to see the signs. So if you see something that looks a bit off, that is, doesn't look normal, phone a rehab center, take a video, send it on, let us look, let us assess, and then from there we can work out a plan of action. Absolutely. And uh, you, you mentioned the, the fences. I know Carl Lloyd, our Belstrom-based white-wing fluff tail project yeah. manager, testing out a new wildlife friendly fence design and that plane wires on the top of it. So we're looking forward to his results coming from, from the building of that fence and hopefully having some concrete proof showing that it can be done if, uh, if the energy is put into making those fences a bit more friendly for our wildlife. And uh, thank you guys for the support that you've given him on that particular project in particular. But um, you also mentioned the poisoning and I see we've got a question here from John. Um, oh, sorry, it's Gemma on John's account saying that you guys are quite close to Kruger and do you ever receive any of the vulture poisoning cases to try and assist with? Okay, um, we are a bit far from, from, from Kruger. We like uh, two and a half hours. So Mogolo Holo is um, perfectly equipped to deal with that. And then very close, um, so they're very, very close. close. Yeah. So a lot of the poisoning cases go to, through to them. And then we do assist if they need overflow or if something like that, then we can assist. Um, but it would probably go to them. And then there were a few poisonings in the south of the Kruger and that went to a rehab center based in Kamati Port. So that is where the, we talk about the collaboration. Um, if you work with, with rehabbers that have specific um, uh, uh, expertise, um, by collaborating, you can get the animals to the to the, the closest, facilities, the closest, closest initially, and then from there it can be transferred to to the specialist one. So so fortunately we've got Maholo Holo there. Um, so but we are there on standby if necessary. We have had a couple of poisonings that come in through from Leidenberg that come this way. Because if you think about it, um, Doc Mike can do 122 kilos in a day on an average day. Um, that could be from the Kruger to us. So somebody could, it could be poisoned in, in the Kruger and it can end up in Leidenberg. And we have it a case like that, um, you know, so, so we do deal with those. So it's basically just, you've got to take it as it comes. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it is quite horrific to see the prevalence of poisoning out there, but all credit to you guys and the work you're doing to try and save these birds that get exposed. Simply horrific what's going on out there. Um, actually, this, one, this one's for you. It's from Penny Abbott. Yep. Um, she's yep. very interested to see how the birds move from tethering to free flight so that they can make it out into the wild. Can you elaborate yep. a bit on, on that process and how you achieve it? Well, basically, I'll give you an example now. I'm busy rehabbing a peregrine falcon female. She gave me another caracoid fracture. Now, if you know birds, you know caracoid fractures you have to go operate it's almost impossible you have to go through the chest area so most vets mm -mm -mm. so it's just rest and physio and then falconry techniques so basically what i'm doing now i tether the bird on the glove first the bird doesn't want to do no you like, oh, no, 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 don't kill me however you just just sit quietly with the bird get it to trust you know listen i'm not going to hurt you here's food positive positive i'm just stroking you i'm not i'm your friend work with me not against me then you basically you call it soft manning 
basically man the bird so that he can trust you. All right. And then you basically just hold the bird on the glove because the bird wants to get away from you. It's a wild animal, hates you. All right. So basically you have to trust the bird and with trust the food comes in. Food, 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 food. All right. And then what you do is when the bird is used to you and she's like, oh, yay, course, yay, food. And then comes to you. Then you start flying the birds slowly and so short distances on a piece of rope which we call crayons, which basically you get the bird to, oh, if I come to you, I get food. Oh, okay, I'll fly to you. And so you build up the trust of flying to the glove. I say, ah, all right, so you're still tethering the bird. And then basically what you do, if you feel comfortable that the bird is trusting you completely, then you take off the crayons, you put the tracker on and you do your first free flight. Let me tell you that first free flight. In all right, so basically you trust the bird, the bird trusts you, the bird comes back to the lure. Then you start, then you start training intensively and you do exercise every day, twice a day. You do, um, my good friend taught me today also what you can do with, 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 uh, with, with falcons, you can do jump tops with them necessarily to build up muscle, to, to fix that muscle and that, uh, that injury. Um, her name is Angelique Ingalls, she's actually a good friend. So she, she, she taught me you can actually do jump ups. So if it's misty like today in Dahlstrom, you, you, you have to do still training. You have to, you know, so you, the bird doesn't sit tethered the whole day. All right, but then basically, after that process, after the bird gets, okay, we use kites to put up with the lure, so the bird gets height, so the bird goes, oh, if I get height, I go faster, and then I get the food faster, and that's how what I'm supposed to do, all right, it's a first year bird, it's not pretty stupid, it needs some help, all right, that's why I got into trouble, 70 to 75 percent of the first and second year birds die of starvation means, so, because the wild is a tough place, all right, and humans are not helping, so basically what happens then is, if your bird, if your bird gets enough fitness, and your bird gets height, then you go into the felt and you basically hunt and your dog comes in your dog helps you to get the quarry to get the food you flush the food the bird comes down to hunt and when that bird is ready you basically cut the equipment off and you you let the bird go all right so unfortunately that bird stays with you for the whole rear process and then the bird go i always tell people you know what it might be cruel it might be this it might be that but at the end of the day you, you you're doing that for the better for the good for the long term that bird will be released so you have to put that bird through that but you never do that in a, in a way that the bird stresses too much or whatever you always think okay what is what what is the bird comfortable with so the bird stresses when you do this all right try another tick try to do that and so if you always think bird but what natural 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 what's less stressful to the bird and stuff so it might seem cruel tethering the birds and stuff but at the end guys especially with species like falcons it is extremely necessary for the better outcome for the for the release and putting the bird back where it belongs into the wild so if it answers the question i don't know um but yeah it, it's it's just unfortunately birds stay tethered with you on the glove till the release day but it flies every day twice, three times a day. All right, so it does have its freedom. It does have its it, um, it, its flights and, and so on, if that explains it. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate the, the passion with which you work with these birds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. It's, I won't do anything else in my life. It's absolutely stunning. For you. It's, it's such a privilege, I'm telling you. Uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have this center, to have all these birds, to be able to work with them and that reward of releasing that bird back into the wild, so it's absolutely stunning. It's, I can't describe it. And I get goosebumps every time I fly that peregrine falcon. It's unbelievable. Oh. Amazing. You're giving me goosebumps just listening to you talk. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We've got uh, time for one more question. And I think um, I was equally horrified. This is from Shashi to see that x-ray of the elastic bands in the stalks stomach cavity that is just something that hadn't even crossed my radar and uh, certainly such a, a horrific thing to to experience and to know that this is so prevalent um further north is, is certainly concerning are we looking at a, another straw gate with rubber bands and do we need to uh, start hopping on about something a bit more sustainable to hold things together do you guys have any any ideas around how we resolve this menace of the rubber band I, I don't know what it is because um, the thing is we're never going to get rid of rubbish dumps and until we change our entire um, way of dealing with that sort of thing, which unfortunately in different countries with different governments, um, it's not an important issue. Um, so we end up having to sit with the mitigation of the, the problem after the fact. I think what is nice 
is that um, now that we know that this is something, uh, if a stork came in, that would be our first port of call instead of the last port of call. Uh, it would be like a routine thing that you would actually get an x-ray for that because um, I think it is in probably in most of, of, of the storks that come in. And if you think about it, you're probably looking at any of the other species that frequent rubbish dumps, which are your hardy dars, um, all of those sort of species. So it's, it's, it's something that we are learning through the errors of, of others. So we can only hope that we can you know, mitigate it in retrospect, but putting the knowledge out there, then maybe somebody will hear who is in a place who can do something about it, and we'll start looking at that or doing a study for that. Absolutely, no, and, and thank you for raising it tonight. Definitely something that we need to be looking at a little bit more closely. Plastic isn't the only menace out there. But uh, yeah. ladies, I cannot uh, thank you enough for coming on the show tonight. It really has been a privilege to have you share all of your incredible insights, and thank you for all of the amazing work you do. I know it is a, a job of passion and I can see how much you guys love what you do. So keep doing it and all strength to you. And I hope everyone tuning in tonight will come and visit you in Dalstrom. I know I always try my best to, to pop in and say hello to all of you and the, all the fantastic birds that are showcasing and being ambassadors for their species. What a, what a wonderful place. So any last thoughts before we wrap up for this evening? No, just that I hope that, uh, you know, we've sort of implanted a small seed that you'll start looking at, at, at your feathered friends in a slightly different way and realize that it's a tough world out there for them. And uh, we, we need mustn't to do, make it tougher. We must make it tougher <laughs> and we must try Shoot and help them, them uh, in any way we can to, to make their life easier because it's not an easy life out there. Absolutely. Ladies, thank you so, so much for joining Thanks. us. Thanks, the... Melissa. Absolute pleasure. We'll see you all next week, Tuesday, seven o'clock as always. We've got Justin Ponder and he's going to be showcasing Neisner and Plett. So do tune in with us and uh, a big thank you as always to all of you for spending your Tuesday nights with us. Keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds and we'll see you next week, everybody. Good night and thank you for joining us.